Happy Friday, everyone. John Lorden here with your weekly episode of Brain Scratch. And boy, do I have something to scratch your brains with today. We have an unidentified person's case that we're going to be looking into. Uh, I usually don't cover these types of cases on the channel because typically there's not a lot of information with unidentified persons. You don't really know who they are. But in this case, there's a lot of details, a lot of talk, and even a lot of pictures around this unidentified person. How do we have that and we don't have the answer? Let's see if we can figure that out together. But before we get started, I want to let you guys know about a bit of a big personal accomplishment. Uh, you might have heard me mention Wraithworks on the channel before. That is a book that was written, written by Frederick H. Crook and I am the story consultant on it. Uh, essentially, he wanted to write a story about a true crime YouTuber that kind of has this adventure, um, and he interviewed me for it on a couple of occasions. Uh, I read it while he was working on it, gave him some more suggestions. He published it, and then we also figured out, hey, you know what, maybe I should do the audiobook version. So. It is now available, Wraithworks, the audiobook. You can check it out at Audible, iTunes, and basically if you purchase a copy of the audiobook, you will also be directly supporting the Lord and Arts channel. So four hours and 57 minutes of recording for this book. And I'm personally proud of it because it's just another thing I've done this year that is new and different for me. Uh, I had to produce this whole thing. I did it right here in the studio, I had to get some more equipment just for doing this. So I hope you guys will check it out and let me know what you think. With all that being said, on to the mystery. Let's learn first about through hiking. Uh, through hiking is hiking a long distance trail end to end within one hiking session. In the United States, the term is most commonly associ associated with the Appalachian Trail, the AT, which we're going to hear several times today, uh, the Pacific Crest Trail, the PCT, and the Continental Divide Trail, the CDT, but also refers to other end to end hikes. The Appalachian Trail Conservatory defines a through hike as one completed within a 12 month period period. So yes, it is a hiker that we're going to be looking into. And uh, essentially, he is found in what is known as the Big Cypress National Preserve. And that is a United States National Preserve located in southern Florida, about 45 miles west of Miami. Let's dive into the case starting at NaplesNews.com. This is an article that was published on August 2nd, 2018. Nicholas Horton felt exhausted, thirsty, and achy, and he only wanted to sit down after hiking more than 10 miles with a friend in Big Cypress National Preserve one evening late last month. The two men arrived at a sign with news they welcomed. A campsite and some water were only 100 yards away. He was slightly irritated when they arrived at the campsite and came across a yellow tent near a picnic table. They saw hiking boots and poles outside the tent he didn't want to intrude on a camper's space, but he needed to get off his feet. His friend Logan Bueller called out to the camper, hello, hello, no reply. Bueller peered through a mesh patch into the tent. I don't think this guy's doing too well, Bueller told Horton. Logan, I think he's dead, Horton said. The men backed away from the tent and Horton called 911. Uh, and these are actual photos. These are the boots that were outside the tent. And here is the tent as it was set up. You can see the picnic table kind of off in the background there as well. They've also got a shot of the poles that they saw there. Let's move on to Fox 4 and continue this. The unidentified man was found on July 23rd in Nobles Camp, approximately five miles north of Interstate 75. He had no identification, and it appeared that he had been living in the preserve. Uh, right off the bat, let me just tell you that um, people are making parallels between the Lyle Stevick case and this one. Uh, and... It's, there is a lot of questions around, is this a person that intended to go out into the wilderness and die? And is there a reason why he didn't have his identification and why apparently he was using aliases because we still don't know who he is. So uh, if that's already tickling in your brain, just know that uh, there's many of us out here that are with you on that. The composite rendering seen here depicts what the man may have looked like. He's described as being 35 to 50 years old, five feet, eight, eight inches tall and 83 pounds with salt and pepper hair and beard. 
Yes, I said 83 pounds. And that's something that on threads, on web sleuths, and on Reddit, a lot of people are questioning if that information is accurate or not. It's been verified several times. He was down to only 83 pounds when he passed away. He had blue gray eyes and his teeth were in excellent condition. And this is the composite sketch that they mentioned. Um, does that really look like him? You're gonna be able to make your own determination on that within a few moments, but let's continue here. Uh, he had black Solomon hiking boots and black and copper outdoor products hiking poles. He was in a two-person yellow Brooks Range Mountaineering brand foray model tent. And let's just get a look at where he was located. You can see this is kind of the, the tip of Florida down here. And we've got Nobles Camp marked right in the middle of it. Uh, the 75 is down here. And they were mentioning he was about five miles away from the 75. Uh, thankfully, someone by the name of Davies Rodriguez uh, also took a 360 photo at that actual site. So uh, we can see it for ourselves here. And if you remember the first picture I showed you, here's the picnic table. So his tent was likely set up over here somewhere. And we can see it's not a huge area. It's just a bit of a clearing. Um, looks like it might be on some higher ground compared to what's around it, which would make sense for Florida. I'm sure uh, moisture, swamps, all kinds of other stuff uh, is is being contended with when you're in this environment. Um, but that is the location. Let's continue with another article over at naplesnews.com. This one is from August 10th, 2018. And we're gonna have a very interesting twist in this. The identity of a hiker who died in Big Cypress National Preserve late last month is still a mystery, but investigators have received tips from online hiker communities that have helped in the investigation. And let me just say, in looking into this case, I've bumped into a lot of online communities that are part of this hiker community. And it seems like there's a lot of very kind people. Um, they seem to kind of take care of each other. Like if you bump into another hiker out there, you guys might couple up and do a certain uh, a certain segment of the hike together, or they might exchange information or maybe even items if the other person needs something. So uh, it's been kind of awesome to see this community rally around trying to identify this man. And that's where we see the first of these photos. This is the man that we're trying to figure out. Who is he? Um, and we can see he's even carrying a through hike uh, logo right there as well. Hikers who think they might have encountered him on the Appalachian and Florida trails sent the sheriff's office photos of the man and shared information about the places they last saw him. Investigators think the man in the photos they received is the same man found in the preserve. Investigators still do not know the man's name. The hiker had no obvious injuries and his death did not prompt suspicion of a crime, the sheriff's office reported. Uh, what's interesting, another interesting aspect outside of not knowing who this man is, is we don't know how he passed away. Now, a lot of people are thinking, well, him down to 83 pounds, standing at five foot eight, um, that probably wasn't very manageable. So is that an indicator of potentially something, did he have a disease or something? Or is that he went out hiking and drove himself into the extremes of that and maybe pushed a little beyond his capability, wound up essentially starving himself or drinking some contaminated water at some point or something along those lines. We don't have an answer. Uh, and it's unclear if the authorities really do or not. I'm almost positive that because they couldn't determine his cause of death, they did an autopsy of some kind. They just have not been public with that information in terms of releasing what the cause of death is. So it's another part of this mystery, unfortunately. And I think that if if they believed that releasing the cause of death would help us determine who he was, I'm sure that they would have done that. So I believe that they're looking at it as the cause of death really has no bearing on trying to figure out who he is. Um, so maybe it is more about you know a, a natural cause of death as opposed to a disease or something. Because if he had a long-term disease, you would think there might be a possibility he was treated for it. There might be people that have that could recognize him around that in some way, but. That's just my assumption. Uh, investigators entered some of the man's forensic information into databases that match unidentified individuals to missing people, according to the social media post. 
I'm pretty sure I know what system they're talking about there. Quote, what we need most from the public is info on the name of the hiker known as Denim and mostly harmless so that his family can be notified and lay their loved one to rest. So apparently that's another thing about this community is uh, they frequently don't use their real names when they're interacting with each other. They kind of have what I consider hiker handles, um, just these kind of you know nicknames that they've either made up for themselves or started themselves. And it appears that he was known by at least two of those nicknames, Denim and Mostly Harmless. Uh, reason for Denim, there's a story out there that's being told by someone that says they interacted with him that he was originally called Denim because when he started on this big hike, he was wearing jeans. And apparently through hikers know that it's terrible to wear jeans. Um, I don't know if it's because of moisture issues or because of the weight of them or something along those lines, but that's how he got the nickname Denim. And then it seems like he kind of shifted to being called mostly harmless after that. Continuing with a different article at Naples Daily News, and let me just thank them for doing such good coverage on this case. I found that they're probably the strongest source of information that's not just essentially repeating things that have been put out by law enforcement. Um, but continuing, the identity of a hiker who died in Big Cypress National Preserve last month is still a mystery, but investigators shared one more clue Monday about the man's identity. The unidentified man used the alias Ben Billamy. Um, so now we have essentially three aliases. Several hikers who met the man during his trek sent tips and photos to the sheriff's office in hopes of identifying him. He went by the trail names Denim and Mostly Harmless. So that is all three of the nicknames we now have for him. Uh, moving on to Fox News. Florida police trying to figure out the identity of a hiker who was found dead inside his tent at a campsite near the Everglades on July 23rd. Say weeks later, they still don't know his real name. Searches conducted on the name Ben Bellamy have been yielding negative results for any matches. And of course, myself, I did some searching on that. Uh, automatically, Google wants to correct it to Bellamy, uh, B-E-L-L-A-M-Y. Um, still just looking through information there. Um, I don't know that that name is really even close to his actual name. I'm, I'm not finding anything that's very compelling about that. Uh, let's go ahead and check out the Collier County Sheriff's Office. This is a case update they released on August 13th. Our investigators have confirmed that the deceased unidentified hiker used the alias Ben Billamy to register at several hostels along his trek from New York to Florida on the AT and FT. If you have any specific information about the identity of this man, please contact us. For those that will ask why this bulletin is from our homicide section, this death is not criminally suspicious. With a low homicide rate in our safe community, our investigators also work all unattended deaths. We know that many of our followers have suggestions and speculations about who he may be. We appreciate your thoughts and interest in this case. At this time, we are looking for his identity or information from those who knew him or know of his family. Our database connections will make appropriate matches on all of those persons that have been reported missing. Thank you. So in a very nice way, they're essentially asking that we don't bombard them with, you know, essentially what I, what I just said, I went and did, you know, started looking online and trying to see if I can match this guy up. Uh, Web sleuths, if you read through the whole thread on this, which is, I think it's just coming up on almost 30 pages. There's a lot of people doing the same thing. They're essentially going through NamUs. They're finding people that match some part of the criteria, maybe the, the height, maybe the age, and saying, could this be him? Could this be him? Uh, the police are basically saying, look, we know those systems will automatically match him because he, his unidentified person's record has already been created there. Um, so those that type of speculation isn't helpful for them. They're looking in particular for people that know him directly. And quite honestly, at this point, you're going to see by the end of this video, there's so much information that's been gathered from people that have encountered him in terms of hiking. I don't know that any more of that information is necessarily going to be helpful unless you're a hiker in particular that remembers a different alias that he used or some other aspect of his backstory. 
Um, but you're going to see there's a lot of people that have come forward with different interactions with him as well. I think what we're really looking for is someone that is a former coworker or someone that worked at a store that he frequented or someone that could possibly tie him back to what his life was before he went on this trek. And it's interesting because even some of the information we hear from the hikers might point us in certain directions in terms of looking back to his life and what that could have been before all this. So continuing on to winknews.com, this is from August 23rd, 2018. Quote, this time of year, there's not a lot of people out there. It's summertime, so it's really hot, it's really buggy, and if it's raining, it's really wet because there's a lot of swamp area, so people tend to stay away from it, said hiker Ashley Howe. Howe said it's easy to get lost. It's unclear how the man died. The sheriff's office previously put out a bulletin in the hopes of identifying the man, but with no luck, they're releasing this video. And essentially what we have here is a video from the GoPro of another hiker. And all we get is if you look here on the left, this is our mystery man, Ben Billamy. You can see he's got the cover on his backpack, that bright red cover that you will see in several photos as we go through here. Um, but that's about it. And there is audio of that that's also included. You can find links to it at Web Sleuths. But unfortunately, all you really hear is the person that's wearing the GoPro. The GoPro. And when Ben is speaking, his voice is so soft and he's so far away that you can't really make it out very well at all. Continuing at nypost.com. Uh, and by the way, guys, I know it seems like I'm picking out just a couple of sentences from each article, but largely these articles are really just repeating the same information over and over and over. So I'm picking out the things that are different from one article to the next. But uh, for this one, nypost.com, there were no obvious injuries, the sheriff's office said. We have info that the deceased may have ties to New York State and Louisiana, the sheriff's office said, and that he may have worked in the tech industry. Now, I believe that information is largely coming from the hikers community as well. And if we move on to another article at WBRZ.com, this is going to support that thought a little bit. Sheriff's deputies in Collier County, Florida have been corresponding with Facebook users for days after the department posted a computer generated image of a man found dead in a tent in Big Cypress National Preserve on July 23rd. He had no identification. It appeared that he had been living or hiking in the preserve, deputies wrote in their Facebook post that has spread like wildfire among hikers pages. In numerous Facebook threads, other hikers said they saw a man matching the likeness up and down the eastern United States. One person suggested they had a conversation about the man being a native of Baton Rouge. Uh, people wrote, in addition to having been told he was born in Baton Rouge, he also told stories about him most recently living in the New York area where he was a programmer before he decided to start hiking. And they've got a snapshot of a conversation thread here. Chris Campbell says, Paul and I seem to recall that he was working and living in Brooklyn and that he was born in Baton Rouge. He said he was a computer programmer. Detective Stills said that he had a bunch of handwritten code in his backpack. Uh, Hayward Warren says, Brooklyn sounds familiar from his story. I definitely remember him saying he was living in the NYC area. I went back to look at John's maintenance notes and he'd written down that he told us he was living in New Jersey. Now that you mention it, I seem to recall the part about being born in Baton Rouge too. Uh, it appeared he had been hiking for more than a year on various trails on the Eastern United States coast. So that's pretty much it for the official news sources that we're going to be looking at on this. Now we're going to shift a little more into the social media layer, a little bit of the hiker community information as well. I'm just trying to highlight all the information I can that might jog someone's memory out there or might help lead us to certain places where we should, we should be trying to raise exposure. Um, at this point, from what we know, mentions of Louisiana, Baton Rouge, New York, but do we know if those are really true? I mean, the fact of the matter is we have him using two hikers names and then one complete alias that doesn't seem to be panning out to be his actual name. So is he really being honest about where he's from or what type of even what type of industry he's working in? 
I'm not 100% sure, but let's go ahead and continue here at whiteblaze.net, which is uh, essentially a community for Appalachian Trail enthusiasts. And we have a posting here from Mug Thumper, August 6, 2018. I met Denim early in his journey the morning of July 28th in Maryland at Raven Rock Shelter. We conversed for about 20 minutes or so before heading our separate ways. I noted that he was new to backpacking, but was very much enjoying the experience. I also estimated that his pack was very heavy at what I guess was 50 to 60 pounds. He started hiking in June in New York. So uh, you can imagine, this is a guy that was really going for a serious hike. He's starting in New York. He's winding up in Florida. Um, and just from this period of time, we can see it. It appears that he was out there for a good solid, even over a year, about 13 months. And there's other information to support that his pack did weigh somewhere between 50 and 60 pounds. He stopped at a hostel at one point, and uh, there was a lady there that took a picture of him with his big pack. She says that she actually tried it on and she, could, she couldn't even wear it. It was so heavy. Um, so does that point to the fact that he might have been a, a beginner or a little inexperienced? Maybe there's there's some other notes we're going to bump into here too. This is from Suzanne's Adventure Journal, which is a blog, and this is when she encountered a campsite near the Oscilla River to the Ring Dyke campsite. This is written on February twenty second, two thousand and eighteen. And this is taking place in St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. I ran a quick map on that. That is about 400 miles away from where he was actually found. And this is February 22nd, 2018. Uh, we can see, I, have to, I just have to say, there are some very beautiful pictures of the scenery here. And uh, I think I get why some people become addicted to this type of lifestyle. There is just really beautiful scenery out there. Um, and apparently a long-suffering road. But let's see about her interaction with him as well. Not far in, we found flooded trail and ended up having to splash through. It was in this section that we encountered a southbound hiker named Mostly Harmless. He was doing the trail without the GPS app or detailed maps. I don't know how he has gotten as far as he has. Both Sugar Rush and I have had issues with the route, even with our GPS position in hand. We exchanged trail information for various sections, going into greater detail than usual to help Mostly Harmless out as best we could. Now, this is a little interesting because other information I've bumped into does also note that he was going without GPS, but I've seen pictures of him literally holding maps. Um, I've seen references to him also having printouts with him of the locations. Uh, in that particular picture, it was for Georgia. So I'm not, you know, I haven't seen a picture in particular where he had information for Florida specifically. Uh, but it seems like at least earlier in his journey, his, um, his preparedness in terms of understanding where he's going might have been a bit stronger than when they interacted with him here. There's almost just a little hint, not even a little hint, there's, it's pretty much spelled out here that they're, they're a little concerned about him in terms of uh, his possibility of, of getting lost with where he's going, uh, not having good information. That's why they, they tried to spend more time with him. Uh, and once again, I just want to call out, this is, I'm just seeing so many examples of these being very good, kind people, very helpful to each other. And uh, I really, really appreciate that. Uh, over at Web Sleuths, we're going to look at several links from Web Sleuths, but this is one that I wanted to share with you guys, just some more information about interactions. I did find some good info from hikers that had encountered him a few times. He was hiking the ECT, Inter Eastern Continental Divide, and he decided to do it with no phone and no GPS. Many people do this hike each year. They run into each other, set up places for people to stop and eat, stop for supply drops, and sometimes stay in hostels, which it sounds mostly harmless did at least once. So uh, the hostels, the mention of hostels, that is part of where his third alias came from, the Ben Billamy alias. Uh, they essentially found, I believe it's three or four different hostels that he stopped at. And that's the name that he used when he signed in there. Uh, there's even pictures of him at these hostels as well. So, 
uh, just keep that in mind as we go forward. Several of the hikers even saw his tent there in that spot, but assumed whoever was in it was tired and just left him alone when they didn't get an answer. Um, that's one of the things that's really tragic about this case. According to the information we do have, it seems like uh, he only died a few days before those hikers found him. But now we're hearing from this information that some other hikers might have come through there as well. They just didn't want to bother him. Um, it just it seems like he might have been close to being rescued if that was really what was going on here, if he had run out of food or, you know, did have some contaminated water or something along those lines. Um, but I think there is still a question in, in, for many of us that was that his intent? Was, was he really looking to be rescued or uh, perhaps did he want his life to end out here in this way? Um, we certainly don't know. He is known to be a very experienced hiker with very good quality equipment. From a couple other hikers, they say he was working for food during the hike. It seems likely that he ended up getting too weak at some point when no other hikers were around to ask for help until it was too late. At one point, Mostly Harmless was asking for directions to a hostel. Without a phone, he couldn't get much help. He was said to be an extremely friendly but quiet guy, and so far I haven't found anybody that knows his actual name. He is listed on the ECT through Hikes website as part of the ECT class of 2018, but unlike the other people listed who had their actual name, their trail name, and where they're from, his only said mostly harmless. Now, interestingly, um, the web sleuths is kind of hit and miss and it's unfortunate. It just doesn't seem like this conversation is moderated very well. Seems like there's a lot of people that are jumping into the conversation that aren't reading the previous pages. There's literally things that are just repeating from one page to the next. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a frustrating read to go all the way through it. Uh, and quite honestly, I didn't find much compelling information there except for photos. And I'm going to show you most of the relevant photos that I found here. Reddit, on the other hand, has turned out to be a very good source for this case. And it's usually the reverse of that in my experience. Usually Reddit is kind of more about where the opinions are and web sleuths is kind of more about the facts. But in this case, because it's really a community that's trying to solve this problem, an existing community, uh, and they're not necessarily web sleuths, Reddit seems to kind of have popped to the forefront. So I've got some things I wanna share with you there. This was posted by Dark Bird is Home. I camped with him in December last year at Springer Mountain Shelter. We got along very well. We stayed up late talking about everything from Doctor Who to growing up with abusive fathers, which we both happened to share. He really was a neat guy with a great story. I'm glad I got to meet him. Just wish he had told me his name. I'm really sad to see him go. High trailer responds to that. Uh, I looked up his trail name and found that it is the title of the last book in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. I also found a post from, I don't know how to say this guys, but I'm gonna give it my best shot, uh, Wolasiyi, where he registered describing how he was employed for 10 years in New York City in IT work. Uh, Dark Bird is home then replies to that. The trail name would make sense as he loved sci-fi and fantasy. We talked for about five hours at camp and had about two more hours of interaction the next morning. I also know he was named Denim because for his first two weeks on the trail, he wore denim jeans. I knew about him being in IT. He didn't talk to his parents, I believe, because of an abusive father figure. He had an ex-girlfriend he mentioned, but I don't know her name. I think he had a sister as well. Nothing I remember is in great detail as my encounter was eight months ago. I called and told the police what I know already. Uh, and moving on to another thread. There's several threads at Reddit about him. Uh, here's someone else, Hank Scorpio, one by one. I met him on the Pinoti in Alabama. He seemed like a nice guy. He just had started hiking when he started the AT, or that's what he told us. My buddy met him the day after we hiked and gave him some info on how to get to the Florida Trail. We both talked to the sheriff's office and told them what he told us. He said he was from Baton Rouge. He said he lived in the New York City area, worked in IT. They found computer code in his bag. He told me he was thinking about inventing some hiking gear that was small and lightweight that could track your hike. The sheriff told my buddy he only had cash on him when he was found and no ID. He didn't have a phone either when we talked to him. 
So if nothing else, at least we know there's no strangeness going on here in terms of possibly his things being stolen. The only one thing we're not sure of is it seems like his pack wasn't mentioned in the items that were found with him. And the hikers are kind of assuming that uh, if he was sick, and we know if nothing else, he was frail, that he might have left the pack behind at some point. So I wouldn't be surprised if that pack actually eventually uh, pops up if someone runs into it. But obviously still had money on him, never had a cell phone. They're confirming he never had a cell phone to begin with. And no ID, which is really the big thing. And it's kind of interesting because um, I think a lot of people, once you get into doing these kind of long distance sports, I know for me personally, once I do started doing long distance running, uh, if you have any mentors or you take any classes or anything like that, one of the first things they tell you about is being sure to have emergency contact information on you. Um, so I'm kind of surprised that he would take on this type of task without having some method of recognizing him or contacting someone if he's found, unless it's in his intent not to have that happen. So I think that's where a lot of us are thinking that maybe this is going to, according to some kind of plan that he had. Uh, another thread at Reddit, Steelmaster J says, I ran into this guy in Shenandoah last year on my section hike. Gonna call in later after I consult my trail journal. Uh, he then later mentions the detective just called me back. I gave him all the info I had about him from that night at Pass Mountain Hut in Shenandoah. He was traveling with an older black lady named Obsidian, and the detective was going to see if he can track her down in case she knows his name. And then we see J.J. O'Malley say her name is Jennifer. She was posting on the sheriff's Facebook page and trekking with him for about 100 miles. Um, from the Web Sleuths thread, uh, I think I've seen a picture of Jennifer and everyone over there seems pretty confident that she has been in contact with law enforcement. Of course, we still don't know his name. So despite the fact that they did 100 miles together, uh, it seems like he just didn't share that information. And once again, is this pointing to the possibility that this is a plan of his, that he wanted to remain unknown while he was out there? Uh, it's possible. Um, could this mean that he was trying to escape something? You know, I, I think some of us have to consider, is this a guy that was some type of convicted felon or something along those lines or was going to be captured for some reason? I don't know, because he certainly wasn't camera shy, as we're going to see here. But we've got one more Reddit post to touch on before we get to the photos. Uh, the last Reddit post, Dear Bert says, you know, it does seem tragic, but I also think maybe he wanted it that way. Being alone and in a peaceful spot doing what you love is probably a lot better than in a hospital hooked up to machines with distant relatives checking their phone. Um, and that's, that's really the big struggle that we have in this story is, is this something that he really did want for himself? Did something happen to him and he wasn't able to get the help that he needed? That is kind of the big question. Um, just looking at it from the outset with him not having ID, Seems like there was some intent for him to kind of disappear in some way. He's not sharing his real name with people. Uh, he's checking into hostels using an alias. Um, I don't know. Once again, I just, I'm kind of on the fence. Is, it, is there some possibility that he had committed a crime somewhere and he just didn't want to be found or something along those lines? I, I can't rule it out, um, except for the fact, like I said, Guy's not camera shy. Uh, another link you're going to see in the sources down below is to a particular post on Web Sleuths. This is posted by Gardner1850, and they have been working very hard to put a timeline together. There's kind of a couple different versions of this timeline. I'm not going to go through it all with you guys um, because a lot of it, I don't know that it's really imperative to the case directly, but I did want to note it for those of you that maybe you're hikers, maybe you want to see where he was at a particular time, because maybe it's tickling in your brain that you think you remember him or something like that. They're basically trying to put together every interaction that he had and the time frames that he mentioned into one long timeline here. So I certainly appreciate them doing that. On top of that, they have a bunch of links. There's maps that you can click on. There's photos you can click on. We've got, of course, his physical description, which we're going to touch on before the end of this episode again. Uh, the clothing and accessories that were found with him. 
his aliases. I mean, there's just a ton of great information in this one particular post. It's so good. I'm going to actually put it at the top of the sources link so you can check it out for yourselves. But here are the pictures. Um, and you're going to see a bit of a transformation here. Uh, what's unfortunate is I don't have dates on all these pictures, but we can see in this photo, he doesn't have the beard yet. Um, he looks pretty clean shaven. He looks pretty healthy. Uh, doesn't look like he's only 83 pounds to me for five foot eight. Uh, he is wearing braces around both knees, but I'm not sure if that's just something he's doing as a preventative measure because of all the, the mileage that he's putting on. Uh, we can also see um, his walking sticks that are right by him and his pack with the red cover that are over here. Uh, moving on to the next photo, kind of a side shot of him reading a book. This is at one of the hostels. Um, I can't remember the name of this one in particular, but once again, we can see he's looking pretty healthy here uh, and happy, by the way. You're gonna notice in most of these photos that um, he seems to be a relatively happy guy. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in on this a little bit. Here we go. And it just echoes what we're hearing from everyone that ran into him, that he was very friendly. You know, obviously people were having good conversation with him, even somewhat intimate conversation when you're bringing up a topic like an abusive father, um, but just not getting his name. Uh, here we've got another photo of him. We can see the beard is getting a little longer, but once again, still looking pretty healthy. Beard's getting a little longer. I can see his face is thinning out a little bit. Uh, the lines around his eyes are starting to show a bit stronger. Beard is even longer. I believe this is at another hostel. Um, once again, just... And here we can see he, his face is really thinning out. His beard is really large, quite a bit scraggly. Starting to see some dark lines kind of under his eyes. Um, and this is one of the images that I've been able to find that I think is one of the later images of him out there. So uh, it's just a, a really big mystery. Who is Ben Billamy? Um, and here at Unidentified Wiki, they have put together a lot of good information. I'm also gonna have the NamUs page in the links down below, um, but this is a little more concise here. Characteristics, um, the only thing in terms of his body, there's been no tattoos uh, that are mentioned. There is a fine linear scar across his abdomen, but they're saying it is very, very faint. In terms of the clothing, he was wearing beige shirt, neon green with gray accent shorts, a gray Russell performance underwear size medium. He had a Columbia baseball hat, very dirty, possibly gray and white. Um, yeah, I think this might be the same hat. It, I mean, pretty much in all these photos, it looks like he's wearing the same hat. So I'd be very surprised if it wasn't uh, that same hat that they're mentioning there. Uh, the yellow two-man tent with the manufacturer being Brooks Range Mountaineering, the model called the Foray, uh, a yellow sleeping bag, Two hiking poles, black and copper color. The brand is Outdoor Products. According to comments on Web Sleuths, that is actually a Walmart brand. Uh, one yellow and gray isobutane 110G fuel cartridge. Uh, I had to actually look that up, but essentially it's like a short fuel cartridge, like you could put um, a burner on top of, and then you can use that for cooking. And then it also mentions a water bottle, but uh, like I talked about before, no mention about his pack actually being found, uh, which is probably the only thing that's missing, but it's interesting because they talk about that he, they still had uh, his money was found. So obviously he didn't keep that in his pack or when he ditched his pack, he decided that he was gonna go forward um, just with the stuff he needs. I'm actually wondering now that I think about it, if maybe he does have ID and maybe it is in the pack. Maybe he just didn't think it was that important to carry that forward or he forgot about where he had stuffed it in the pack or um, he felt too sick and it just didn't occur to him, something along those lines. So maybe there is some potential if that pack is found out there in the wilderness somewhere that it might have the answer to this question. But there are so many questions with this case. Did he intend to go out there and spend the rest of his days out there? Uh, was he really trying to finish this long trek and make it to the Florida Keys? 
um, which it seems kind of sad. It looks like he was pretty close con- considering the amount of distance that he had covered up to that point. Um, there's even some talk about the possibility that he might have mentioned that he was divorced. There's just there's so much in terms of motivation that we don't understand here. But the main thing is trying to figure out what is this man's name so that his family uh, can grieve and bring him home and lay him to rest. I mean, that's that's really what's most important about this case. So please share this in the areas that we spoke about in today's episode. Um, but honestly, it's one of those cases, I don't know, I don't know if we can really rely on this information about him being from New York City. Seems like uh, it's kind of an easy thing to uh, kind of just spit out, you know? Oh yeah, I worked in IT in New York. What's interesting is about the code um, because if he was trying to write some application while he was out there, that's pretty telling. At least we might know that we have his occupation right. Um, but I really don't know about the locations that we're hearing about. And we don't have the hikers talking about recognizing an accent either from New York or from Louisiana, which is kind of strange to me. So um, I don't know. I don't know, guys. This one really has me scratching my brain. All right, uh, before we get to the comment review for last week's episode, I just want to remind you guys, Crime After Crime, episode two has been released. It is called The Sleepwalking Defense. Uh, It's a pretty intense episode. They, both cases do involve a murder. So a little bit of a change in tone from Crime After Crime, episode one to Crime After Crime, episode two, but that's the flexibility that Danielle and I were looking for when we made that show format and we're going to take advantage of it. Um, The sleepwalking defense, the story that I talk about, I have talked about here on Brain Scratch once before, but only in a very brief way. I go into a lot more details on the crime after crime episode. So you might want to check that out. Also, we now have an official Twitter account for crime after crime. It is at crime after pod. They only give us so many letters, so I had to figure out something that would work. At Crime After Pod, it's an easy place you can go to. You can follow us there, and that way you'll know when new episodes come out. You can find the links for voting on the episodes, which I'm telling you guys, I need your help. She has such a bigger audience than me. I got crushed last month, um, but it's all at, at Crime After Pod. I hope you guys will check it out. All right, before we get into the official comments for Roxanne, there was one comment from Susan Hugan who said, John, Crime Watch Daily wasn't picked up for another season, so they changed their name to True Crime Daily on YouTube. Uh, Thank you so much for putting this story up front again. Austin is less than an hour from me and a lot goes on there. More bad than good. God bless her and her family. Uh, Thanks for letting me know that, Susan. I wasn't aware that True Crime Daily uh, or that Crime Watch Daily had kind of evolved to True Crime Daily, but it makes sense because if the TV show didn't get picked up, they probably didn't have the rights to carry on with the name. So now the website's being rebranded, the YouTube channel's being rebranded. So thanks for at least solving one mystery for me. And thank you for your kind wishes about the Roxanne Paltoff case. That is is the case where Roxanne was celebrating her second anniversary with her boyfriend. They went to a hotel that some would say is in a questionable part of town. And unfortunately, they get in a fight. Roxanne leaves and is never seen again. One of those cases that just it feels like it should be solved. And unfortunately, it's been years and years and it hasn't. Uh, let's look at a comment from Mr. F's 101. Why are we trusting anything the hotel clerk is reporting when she seems to have spent an inordinate amount of time with Roxanne's boyfriend right after she went missing, regardless of polygraph results? What kind of person goes to spend that much time with a guy she just met who was just having a huge fight with his girlfriend? What kind of man hooks up with a stranger while on an anniversary celebration with his girlfriend, fight or not? Did he ever mention getting a ride from a random deaf man while they were there? Did he ever mention Roxanne's ID being missing? Seems very shady to me. Uh, Yes, there is a lot about this that is shady. And I'm actually wondering about the hotel clerk and if she really didn't know him before this. Uh, I did look into his criminal history a little bit, and I do believe he has other crimes that are committed in this area. It could be that he is familiar with some people in this area. So I'm not 100% of the mind that he didn't know the clerk. Uh, And I'm with you on the polygraph results. Uh, I'm telling you, there's just, 
the information that we were given is too loose for me to say, oh, well, that's conclusive. She definitely saw Roxanne. That's really the big question for me. Did she indeed see Roxanne or did she see this guy that was walking by that acted like he was walking after someone, then turned around, came in and started flirting with the clerk? I just... The whole situation, the way it's described, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I just wish we had more detail. Uh, Diana Franzdahl. Of course, the clerk would lie for the boyfriend. She spent the night with him till 3 a.m. She clearly likes him romantically. Also, what you said about the missing clothes or other girls' clothes possibly not being returned because he either used them for something or they had evidence on them, the evidence idea really seems to click especially if the clothes were really on the floor, like he said. But I wonder if those clothes belong to the hotel clerk or she let him raid the lost and found. Uh, Diana, really good thoughts on that. Yeah, I would, I'd be interested in knowing where he would have gotten those clothes as well. Uh, unfortunately, there wouldn't be a great way to trace that. But if you could answer that question, you know, like if the clerk would step forward and say, by the way, I know where those clothes came from because he told me that I need he needed to get a bunch of clothes together and I let him raid the, the lost and found. That would be very, very compelling. Um, but unfortunately, without someone coming forward about some detail like that, I just don't know how that information can tie us or, or tell us the truth or lead us in the direction of getting to the truth here. Um, and I'm telling you guys, I'm still just banging my head on this time frame. The way that he used that phone to me feels like he was intentionally creating an alibi for himself, which tells me the time frame we're looking at is wrong, that we need to roll that clock back and look earlier into that evening. Terry Rushka, I don't care how mad I am. I'm not leaving my cell phone and bag behind. Terry, I can't agree with you more. I can't think of a situation where I would leave my cell phone. I hardly leave my cell phone if I'm just walking outside. I'm pretty much grabbing it and it's going in my pocket. So uh, particularly in an argument um, and knowing that she's leaving without her purse. I mean, if I was only going to take one item, if I was in that type of situation, I think I'd take my cell phone because if nothing else, even if I don't have money, I could always call family. I could always call friends. I could at least access services and resources through my cell phone. Um, yeah, it, it is very, very strange. And then of course, his use of the cell phone after is beyond strange. It's, um, it's just, it's mind boggling. The Lady Gunsmith, this has got to be so hard for her family when you have a pretty good idea of who knows the story and they just aren't fessing up. When I was young, I was naive too and hung out with less than savory people and you get into a thought process that, yeah, they do this and that, but they would never do it to me. I truly hope they can find some information to help her family find peace and closure. If the family is reading comments, please work with John. He cares about these cases and is never less than respectful with the information and families. Uh, thank you so much for saying that, uh, the Lady Gunsmith. And yes, Roxanne's sister is in contact with me. I don't know if it's going to lead to follow-up episodes or not, but uh, she was very appreciative. She also added some comments into the comment thread down below. So, uh, Rosalind... Thank you. Um, I'm glad that we were able to do it respectfully. And if you do want to come on, please just reach out and we can absolutely make that happen. Um, there's another aspect to your comment that I want to touch on too. I, I, what hurts me most about cases like this is thinking about my life and the fact that, you know, I didn't live a perfect life up until this point either. I think all of us, if we're really honest with ourselves, can look at our history and say, wow, that particular time for me was pretty risky or wow, I was really in a circle of people I shouldn't have been in at some point. And especially when we're talking about someone this young, it really hurts me that they don't have that chance to learn from that experience and to move their life in a different direction. And I know some of you in the comments were struggling with, well, but she decided to be around these type of this type of person and she decided to go stay in that type of area. I get it. But if we never have the chance to learn from those experiences, um, I, I just I, I see that it's reasonable to me that we will make missteps as as we're going through this life, and some missteps are worse than others. Yes, but just the fact that she's not able to move forward and learn from that experience is probably what hurts me the most about this case. Um, I certainly think that if Roxanne was here to talk about it, that she'd say, you know what, 
I think that I probably shouldn't have done this or that I probably shouldn't have done that. But unfortunately, we don't have her here to talk to about that. And I think a lot of us think that she does not have the ability to have this, have the hindsight of, of that situation. It's really, it's what weighs me down a bit about these types of cases. Uh, it just, it really breaks my heart that young people can't learn these lessons and become more mature adults like some of us have gone through ourselves. So, uh, Dr. Gunsmith, are you related to the lady gunsmith that just commented before? Uh, I'm thinking both men knew each other and they both did something to this poor young girl, some very evil men in this world. They both are probably involved as a team involved in trafficking. Uh, I certainly consider that aspect to this case. It does feel like there are elements of trafficking. I, I touched on that in the last episode. You know, I've talked to people that deal with helping children that are in trafficking situations. We're seeing that there's warning signs of that definitely going on here. Um, th there's this weird thing in me where I, I'm not even sure if I should hope that that is actually the answer, because if it is, it means that maybe she is still alive, that she is still somewhere, that she can be rescued from that situation. Um, in some way, thank you. Let me just say, I'd, I'd really appreciate Destiny Rescue. We're still making monthly donations to Destiny Rescue. And um, I just, I'm so amazed at the work that they do. I wish that I knew of an organization that was doing it uh, in the US like they're doing it for the rest of the world because I would support that organization as well. But yeah, I struggle with that myself, Dr. Gunsmith. Is If that is the answer, is that really a better answer as opposed to her life being ended and her not having any chance to come back from it. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, it's just such a tough case. I really feel for this family. And I, I thank you guys. Once again, I read through the entire comment chain and uh, it was overall very, very respectful. Um, there was even cases where people made comments, but then they kind of said, oh, I wish I didn't say it that way. Um, that's what this is about for the rest of us too, is just learning from these situations, learning from these experiences and evolving ourselves. And um, I want Roxanne to have that too. I still want Roxanne to have that. That's, that's really what breaks my heart about this. Uh, finally, before I sign off, I just want to give a big thank you to Dr. Gunsmith, who made a donation through PayPal. Thank you so much, Dr. Gunsmith, and Christy Groves also for her PayPal donation. Not to mention, I forgot to mention it at the start of the episode, but Christy Groves and Ian both uh, suggested this topic to me, and Ian actually sent a bunch of research that helped get me kickstarted on this. So thanks to both of you for today's topic as well. Take care, everyone. I hope you have a nice Friday, a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you back here on Monday on the Lord and Arts channel.